Okay, ready? Ready. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, we are graced by the presence today of Dr. Emma Wedgworth. Um, I've been to see Dr. M privately when I had a massive, what was it? I can't remember, was it just a dermatitis reaction? Yeah. And it was like 24 to 36 hours before I was going on this morning. Just wanted to put that extra pressure on me, didn't Just had a bit, a bit of a panic. Um, I asked the Freaks group, once again, my source of all <laughs> questions, knowledge, memes, anything really, um, for questions and they have been, we haven't really gone through them, they were taken from the Freaks group by Molly, printed off. So we are just going to get straight into it, it will be all over the place as always. If I'm coming across a question that we've previously answered, I will maybe just say, oh just to clarify this or whatever, anyway we'll be fine. Um, How impressive were these questions? They're, I mean, I've, the ones I've scanned. I know, literally, like, yeah. you just showed me the first couple, and I was like, are these actually from dermatologists? Like, you guys know a lot about skin. It was very impressive. Freaks. <laughs> okay, three things I can do that you all agree, uh, that you all agree on as being great for your skin. Conflicting advice drives me bonkers. Derm, nutrition, esthetician perspective. I understand that. There is conflicting advice, but I think a lot of the conflicting advice comes from the if you're also looking or watching or reading green or clean beauty. Mm. That's in people I think are particularly different. Clean beauty drives me up the wall, but actually- Excellent, you... excellent place to start. Yeah, thank you. Um, but I think if you, like you said, actually we all agree on the fact that you shouldn't go excessively in the sun because that will prematurely age and damage your skin. Don't smoke because that really damages your skin. You should be using SPF, right? A no brainer. Mm -hmm. um, those are three already mm -hmm. that we've managed to get. I think there are some doctor brands who, for example, Marco from Zellens hates glycolic, mm -hmm. whereas Dr. Dennis Gross, his whole line is built on loving glycolic. Yeah. So I understand that part of it. But in general, if you had to do a generalized advice, yeah, it would be, you know, vitamin A is good. Vitamin A is excellent. Vitamin C is good. Mm -hmm. um, Although there are, you know, there are now like estheticians, mainly in America, I think, saying that hyaluronic acid is bad for you and vitamin C is going to oxidise and that's bad for you. And I just think, are there clinical trials or is this sort of just a, a feeling? Just a feeling. I think there's no evidence that hyaluronic acid is bad for you. And it's in so many different products, yeah. isn't it? Even if it's not the main ingredient, it's around everywhere. Big molecules, seldom goes deep down. It's not. Mm. bad for you mm. and vitamin c i think overarching actually we find it's useful yes it can oxidize and yes occasionally it can cause problems if you're not treating it right it's not packaged yeah. right all of that sort of stuff but on the whole i think that those sorts of things vitamin a sunscreen vitamin c actually most people can incorporate those really successfully and it, it works really well on most people's skin c ledge you have 20 pounds to build an entire routine what do you buy do you know what though? I think now, if you had asked me this question like five or ten years ago, I might have been like, whoa, I don't know. But now, actually, I do think there are quite a lot of products in every sort of budget range. So actually, I think £20, you would easily be able to get a decent cleanser, cleanser mm -hmm. moisturiser, sunscreen, SPF. and a vitamin A. I yeah. think that's probably as much as you could get for £20. Yeah. I mean, you're pushing it. You are pushing it, especially with the SPF. But Yes. But if you have to just pick three, I would cleanse, moisturise, SPF. Absolutely. Personally. And then, you know, when you've got £20 a bit later on, maybe look into a retinol and maybe a vitamin C. Yeah. Or an acid, depending, because a lot of people don't, they've been so put off by using a retinoid that they prefer an acid and it's that kind of finding your balance, I suppose. But then it becomes about what is your skin type and what your individual skin needs. So actually, mm. I don't think that it's necessarily like conflicting advice, but yeah. it's about saying what's gonna work well for my skin. And that is the problem. Sometimes, as much as there are some basics that we do for like everybody, then you think, right, okay, what am I actually trying to achieve? And then that's when you start to adapt it to yourself. So, I think that's oh. very true. Um, is there anything you can do to remove or lessen sebaceous hyperplasia? So I don't want to dermsplain here, but no, do do we know what sebaceous hyperplasia is? No, go for it. So basically, what can sometimes happen is that your sebaceous glands, which produce your oil, start to develop those little tiny bumps on your skin, and then you get these like flesh-coloured bumps, which are tiny normally, but they are just overgrowths of sebaceous glands, particularly in oily skin, that tend to happen on the surface of the skin. And um, people often confuse them for milia. Milia. Sometimes okay. actually they can look like um, early sorts of skin cancers. They're, they're all sorts of things they can be confused with, but they are overgrowth of sebaceous glands and they're hugely common. I see them all the time mm -hmm. in clinic. 
Um, so the thing, once they've actually developed on the skin, it's really hard to totally um, get rid of them with cream. So then you have to have them removed. And either you can have them like slightly burnt off, you can have them lasered off, you can have them sh shaved off. Um, but to prevent them from coming back, actually you just want to regulate your sebaceous glands. So all the ways that we do to try and treat oily skin, like retinoids, salicylic, glycolic, all of those sorts of things can try and prevent more from developing. But once they're there, unfortunately... You have to go and see someone like you. Well, I didn't like to say, Caroline. No, do yes, say, exactly. do say. <laughs> just don't try and pick them out yourself. Oh, no, no. I get that a lot. Can Definitely I get this milia out no. myself? And I look at it and I think... No. <laughs> no. I mean, if things aren't coming easily, they are not. Sebaceous eye laser does not come out easily. I mean, literally, mm. you have to be getting it off the surface. Mm. So, Don't that's what it pick. is. Okay. How long is a reasonable time to give a skincare routine in showing the results you want, e.g. using Tret or adding oils to your routine? Okay, those are two really separate things. Yeah, they really are. <laughs> so, like, if you want to add Tret and want to see how long that's going to take, I think three months. You know, actually, by the time the Tret gets in, it changes the way that the cells are working. You then start to see that change. You give it a couple of skin cell cycles, right? So yeah. you're looking at, like, eight to 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. Oils, I think you'll probably know fairly quickly... Pretty much how immediately. exactly your skin's yeah. going to respond to them. And that's either, like, by irritation... Um, so if you're irritant, you're going to notice within you know, a few days. Mm -hmm. um, or you might notice that for some people who are quite oily, it might start to you know, clog things up. That might take a little bit longer. But I think it totally depends on the product. Yeah. What do you think? I do. And I also, but I also think with uh, Tret, absolutely. And similar for things like, um, like an azelaic or a niacinamide or a hydroquinone product yeah. on prescription. But an oil, if you're adding an oil to your routine, you would... I mean, let's face it, the reason a lot of people look good after they've been for a treatment is because you've had oil put on your face and sometimes for the first time ever. Yes. The amount of women who would come to me for a facial and they'd never put oil on their skin because they were worried about it. Yeah. And you know, by the time you've peeled them and then done a little bit of oil and massage, their skin's glowing. Mm -hmm. So oil, you kind of know straight away. Yeah. Um, top two recommendations. One drugstore, clearly an American. One <laughs> high end of topical products to help minimise the appearance of acne scarring slash pigmentation again very different okay but that's four recommendations it's going to end up being four <laughs> okay i'm a bit of a broken record i'm really sorry about this no no it's good me scarring retinoids mm -hmm. like absolutely and then for me azelaic as well so combination of azelaic acid and retinoids i find really powerful and when and what creams would they be on prescription because here obviously they're yep. different i see a lot of people going you should just use this but it's us okay and, and even now i mean a, a cream i i was recommended when i first went to justine cook who i went to yeah. and then she very rudely got pregnant justine she, how, <laughs> could you? how could you um I'll get Justine on as well, actually. But she gave me Pigmenorm, and now you can't get that. It's lost its license. And that had hydroquinone, uh, I think it was steroid, and retinoid. And retinoid. Oh, yeah. it was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like this big, and they were like, you can't use too much. And I was like, okay. If you know where to get it, you can still get it a little bit. You know, if you know the right people. Um, <laughs> okay, but so acne scarring, I think great place to start because often we see so many people like this in clinic and often you've still got a couple of spots hanging around. So you want to deal with those and also deal with your acne scarring. So I'd say azelaic acid, finacea and skinnerin. Yep. They're the two formulations yep. that we have here. And then either a plain retinoid, just Tret 0.05, or if you're really oily, 0.1, or you could then think about something like Tretlin over the counter, um, which, which not over the counter, on prescription, which has got a little bit of topical antibiotic, you're still getting a bit of anti-active mm -hmm. uh, acne. So that's what I do for pigmentate uh, for acne scarring. For pigmentation, sunscreen. I mean, the studies really, literally, sunscreen by itself mm. has such an improvement. Mm. Um, and then, if you've got really significant pigmentation, like I think they're probably thinking melasma. It's probably going down the melasma. Melasma, um, triple combination cream, like you were saying, mm. pigment norm, that can help. Um, or even retinoids by itself, that can help. Retinoid plus four percent hydroquinone. I don't tend to go much beyond four percent hydroquinone. No, I, that's what I use, and I I got that for a while from Dermatica. Yeah. Um, and I actually emailed them because you know they do the, the sort of check in to see how you yeah. and I said actually I need to scale it back because the 1% one percent point one is it's just too much and I'm yeah. finding I don't want to use it and I, I don't want to have that terrified flaky pastry face all the time and if I'm filming I'm doing events yeah, I so I scaled it back to a 0 0.05 and that's been better but I'm still peeling I mean it just shows I think I, I, I do need to focus and do it I mean I need to take my own advice and just get a bit more regular it's the hardest thing to do though isn't it I mean I need to d take my own I did take my own advice with the Abaji because that had um, some hydroquinone in the yeah. prescription one and that was really great and I've used all that up so now I'll go back and make sure I'm doing all the tret 
Do you know what though? I, I have to say, I'm quite cautious around the track and I don't push the skin too hard. I have a lot of people come No, I, I don't really these days. Pushing it. Yeah. And I spend a lot of time saying to people it's not worth it. Like, listen to your skin. There is 0.025 as well. There's 0.05. Yep. You know, you can, and you can finesse it so that you get yeah. a really nice sort of look. So I think I that's, that's where I am because I get people all the time saying, you haven't talked about acid in a while. And I'm like, well, I'm using I'm using my actives at the other end of my routine. Right. So I'm not really using as much acid. If I do, I use it in the morning mostly. I'm using like a polyhydroxy acid. Yeah. Something a bit lighter. Absolutely. Um, I occasionally wield out the P50. Occasionally wield out when the P50. Big guns. Yeah, but not. Like I would never dream of using it at the same time as I'm using my trek or anything like that these days. I did when I was playing around, you know, in the early days of the blog and stuff. But you just get to the point where you're like, I don't want my face to be obviously into something. <laughs> but I, also, I think we're in it for the long game. Your, your skin has to last you a really, really long time. And one thing that I'm really obsessed by is skin barrier. And if you keep mm. pushing it too much, you're gonna break down that skin barrier. Yeah. Um, and then longer term, it's just not gonna be a good yeah. thing. So it is, it's a marathon, it really is, this whole skin care. Stop sprinting. Stop sprinting. Well, this is the same thing. Best treatment for different types of acne scarring. I wonder if you're, you mean treatment as in things you can do with mechanics as opposed to creams, potentially? Because there is other questions further down about dermaplaning and yeah. PLP and... I, I think it's a whole... The first thing about acne scarring, get your active acne under control. Like, if mm. you don't get that under control, and some people are so desperate to get in with the scarring, which I totally understand, but actually they've still got a load of active acne going. You're like, no, 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 what? Fix that first. Fix that first, and then we'll clear it all up. And I have to say, by the end of a treatment of when you've really dealt with the acne, often people are like, yeah, I've got a bit of scarring, but actually it doesn't bother me that much, and yeah. I can cover it up with a bit of makeup. But if you do want to target scarring, there's so much stuff yeah. that you can do. But I think you have to identify what type of scars you've got, what type of skin you've got, because acne scarring just comes in so many different Do you want to give a very brief overview, like sort of the main different types and yeah. how you would recommend they treat? Because I know if you leave them hanging with that, it's going to be, well, <gasps> yeah, but my, I've got hypertrophic. I've got mine are really deep, mine are really tiny, yeah, mine are red, yeah. mine are raised. Yeah, exactly. A rough overview. Okay, so... First of all, the most common type of acne scarring that we often see is, is pigmentary change. And that can either be darker marks, like hyperpigmentation, or it can just be red marks. And actually, particularly with the red marks, they will fade over time. So sometimes there isn't a change in like the contour of the skin. Mm -hmm. It's just that either there are red marks on it or there are brown marks pigmentation. So that's one thing, the sort of pigmentary change that you can get. Then there's contour change, where the actual active acne and the, like, the body trying to repair that has changed the collagen or changed the structure of the skin. And that's where you start to get a bit of deep, um, dipping. Um, and either you can get sort of pitted scars, where you get lots of little tiny dots, or you can get um, different types of rolling scars, where you get almost like a roll um, uh, in, the, in the skin, and that's where you get all that sort of pitting. Then you can get um, scars, which like you were saying, sort of lumpy, so keloid scars, hypertrophic scars. And it is really important to understand what you have because actually the treatment for like red marks on the skin is going to be totally different than the treatment for yeah. hypertrophic lumpy scars on the skin. Um, so the understanding what type of scarring you have, whether it's pigmentary, whether it's contour change, i.e. dipping, or whether it's, it's overgrowth on the skin bumpiness is so important. And would you, what do you find you treat the most? What's the most common? I think the pigmentary. So actually, when you get a big lumpy spot, it very, very commonly leaves a red mark on there that's there for either. That goes brown. Or... I've got one. Yeah. We've been here forever. It's really but annoying. You've got a bit. Of, you know, if you like me, you don't have any natural melanin. There's no brown going on, but there's actually red and things going on. So I think those are the sort of things like you say, bit of brown marks, bit of red marks, um, and they will often resolve by themselves. Um, and the next one that we tend to see is like a little bit of dipping, pitting, rolling scars, um, those sorts of things. And how often? How soon, sort of, how old is probably a better question. So, say someone had scarring from being a teen and they come to you in their 30s, yeah. what would you recommend that they can do to at least fix anything where it was pitted or? Yeah, so I think if you've had scarring for like 10, 15 mm -hmm. years, then you are thinking about procedures. Yeah. Um, and there are so many different things that we can try. So, and you start maybe from like least invasive to most invasive. Mm -hmm. So, least invasive microneedling, yeah. I mean, works really nicely. You can do different needle depths on different areas of the skin, and it's it's good for the more sort of the, the shallower scars, but not for the really really deep mm. ones. In clinic microneedling, so you can do a proper needle depth. Yes, exactly. I think 
when you look at the evidence, the, the medical needling stuff where you can actually get down 1.5 you know, plus is where actually most of the results come for scarring. You know, the, the home ones maybe are okay for like a little bit of rejuvenation and freshening, mm -hmm. but not for sort of deeper scarring. Yeah. Um, laser, so various different lasers, either just non-ablative, non where you're not sort of totally taking off the epidermis, um, which doesn't have as much downtime, yeah. um, or, you know, Fraxel CO2 laser for deeper scarring. And then sometimes... Um, which you're going to need to stay at home for a little while and just let that heal. Two weeks or so. You know, if you can do two weeks downtime and you've got quite a lot and you don't have pigmented skin as well, because mm. I think the risk of um, hyperpigmentation or the risk of getting brown marks after you've had laser yeah. when you've got darker skin is is significant. Mm -hmm. um, so either laser. And then for individual scars, then often we do subcision, which is where you put a needle okay, in. Okay, I'm obsessed with that. So I can't do it. Like, it's not something I would do. No. I'm not your... You're the doc. But there are certain docs in America who put it on their Instagram. Yeah. And you watch it and you go, oh! But describe briefly what it is. I will link to it below because if you are, if you're squeamish, don't click on it. If you have acne scarring and you want it to go away, absolutely have a look. But it is, I would just call it gently uh, invasive. Gently invasive. <laughs> it's invasive. Yeah, it's invasive. It's just invasive invasive. Right? Yeah. Um, although I was saying I'm gently trying to describe it as invasive. <laughs> it's always done under local anaesthetic, so actually you're not going to be like, oh my goodness, you know, it's not, it doesn't feel as bad once you're actually having it done. But essentially it is just sort of taking a needle, because when, and, and trying to untether scars, and then trying to get the body to heal in a, in a sort of more uh, normal fashion, so that actually the tethering, which is what produces the dips, actually starts to improve, and normal collagen is produced to try and improve the appearance of the scar. And I'm just trying to describe it to these guys almost like if you think of scarring as it's when you have a pitted scar it's just dropped an anchor yeah. and it's just there and yeah. what you're doing is taking a not small needle and they literally are just like <clears throat> and yeah. breaking the anchor exactly so that it's then free flying as it were Brilliant. and then you can attempt to let it heal yeah. it's um interesting it is interesting, and it's and it's but it's very good for really you know one or two deep areas, and then sometimes we can inject filler and various different things in in other deep cells. So you, you really have to acne scarring treatment is a process. Like yeah. it's not there's one treatment that can just zoom. And that's what really gets me when I see uh, brands that even legally they shouldn't be saying helps with acne scarring, and I think. Yeah. That's optimistic. Wow, okay, yeah, you're I mean, good. Great I just want to point out that the doc does have a brew, it's just that I'm busy drinking it and Look, she's I not. Do. I'm not she being didn't rude. She did leave me. Um, but just going back to the acne scarring, yeah. that is one thing why I'm obsessed with treating acne because mm -hmm. actually, you can, I, I think still, we can treat active acne much more simply than we can treat acne scarring. Yeah. So actually, we just don't get it, let it. Get it in right? early. Right. So and that's what I say when I say to people if you've if you've done, if you've been to your GP, I'm talking about mainly in the UK, if you've been to your GP, if you're still not happy, if they've put you on antibiotics, which we'll come to, if you feel like you're not being heard, please try and get to a derm. derm. It is hard. I know there's like like 200 minimum mm. shortage of derms in the UK. Um, and I always say, don't credit card your skincare, but I would credit card your health. And I see that as also intrinsically as your mental health too, because people with acne, it is, it does affect you. Yeah. Uh, hugely and I think the longer it goes on the more it affects you and then sometimes even when your skin gets better you've just been so sort of traumatized by it that your perception of your skin and your sort of body image yeah um, is is just really I, I spend a lot of time telling people who used to have acne that they don't now right. and saying but you don't need to worry about that now I can tell that your skin you're not where you were please don't worry your skin's glorious and they're like if I use an oil it's gonna come back and I just think oh have you heard of this thing called cutaneous body image CBI mm. so it's this marker of how we judge our skin and it's it's such a fascinating concept it's almost like you know sometimes you get like body dysmorphic like just not being able yep. to see how amazing they exactly look. because you've had so many years of having bad skin it just takes such a toll I had that in Dublin a lot of girls love Dublin in my last event and I spent most of the night telling the girls how amazing their skin yep. was and they half of them couldn't see it and they would talk about pores that you couldn't even see. Right. And they're like, but my pores are really bad. And I'm like, and I would no. look at their face and I would hold it with a lot of hand sanitizer and just be like, <laughs> you're gorgeous. I, know. I don't know what you're looking at, but this is all gorgeous. But this is what I spend my time in clinic saying. It's like, you're so harsh on yourself. Look how many good things there are about your skin. But, mm. but people are so critical of themselves. Mm. And sometimes it's, it really starts to define their lives. It can yeah. be really tricky. Okay, how to care for skin that has been through chemo, face and 
body we're back to barrier repair yeah we really are i have quite a few patients who've been through chemo and i think you know once you're going through that you really want to try and look after the skin it really changes your cell turnover and like you were saying actually can just break down your skin barrier and um, so actually it's just all about the hydration love you know really really making sure that you're not stripping things no with, actives don't right, get too excited right give it time to heal just easing right right back lots of hydration stick with a nice hydrating cleanser rich moisturizer and just you know let the actives go for a bit and then start to slowly reintroduce them so that's what i tend to do with mine it's kind of i know it sounds i don't mean it's easy but it's an easy to treat because it's very much a case of less is more it's so your body is going on with has so much going on that you just want to do what you can to make it comfortable Definitely, definitely. So just ease it right back. And then when that's all over, that's the time to like really get into your new skincare regime. You, you want to feel great, you want to really start then. Um, but at the time, it's just ease right back. Yes, take it easy. Yeah. Okay, is it better to use fillers and Botox every six months for crow's feet or an expensive eye cream? In 10 years time, what will bring better results? I'm sorry, I'm gonna go procedural. And oh, I think, you know, the, the, the very fact is it's really hard to find an eye cream that has a really significant sort of impact. The eye area is so tricky. I mean, mm -hmm. I spend a lot of my time worrying about my eye area. Um, See, you're doing the same thing. Your eyes are great. <laughs> That's only because I'm doing something about it, Karen. <laughs> but, I mean, essentially, it's so hard to put actives on the eye area because it's such a thin, delicate yeah. area of skin. And because there's so much change going on underneath, like your fat's being resorbed, your bones are changing there. I mean, it's just so hard. So, yeah, you can make significant improvements in some areas and you can protect it really carefully. But to really shift things with creams in that area is hard. So I'm going to go procedures. Yeah, I am... Um... I sort of say to people on repeat, mainly about dark circles. Yeah. If you've got dark circles, get a good concealer or get filler. 100%. But it, dark circles is almost just an impossibility unless you're doing it cosmetically with, but, but lines and sort of fine lines and getting your eyes ready for under makeup, that's pretty easy. There are lots of good eye creams that will do that. But bear in mind, if, you're, if you want 10 years time that will bring results, it's always going to be a needle. Afraid so. But that doesn't mean you need it now. It might be in 10 years you do. Or you may say you might say actually I'm all right with my lines, but then you still don't have to spend all the loads of money on super super expensive yeah. eye creams. Make sure you bring various products up to your lash line. So sunscreen up there, vitamin C up there can be fantastic. Um, and I also say don't forget if you are someone who wears glasses and you don't have SPF and you don't have prescription sunglasses, you have to wear sunglasses when you're outside. Yes. The amount of time and I only literally this year got prescription sunglasses because I have to wear glasses yeah. to drive, I'm short sighted, so I have to wear glasses to drive, and when the sun is blaring down, I know that I've basically got a magnifying glass yeah. over my eye. Yeah, 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 no, it's such a good point, such a good point, and for your actual eye. So, oh yeah, my yeah. poor eyes, I'm just thinking about the lines. Yeah, I mean obviously <laughs> the lines, but also that retina. <laughs> oh God, okay, um, dermaplaning, I don't even know what this is, I'm just gonna read, dermaplaning, yeah. PRP, light deep chemical peels, have you had any, and what has worked for you, and what ones would you say are pure fads and nonsensical? And maybe that was for me, but we can both do it. Yeah. Um, dermaplaning, I haven't, PRP, I haven't, obviously I've done light and deep chemical peels, not that deep, I'm scared. My skin yeah. is quite sensitive, I don't really need a deep, I yeah. like light, and I like like a wimpy light, like lactic. Yeah, yeah, really light. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need salicylic, I'm not spotty, and I'm, I'm, overly cautious of glycolic and I, it could be that Marco's rubbed off on me I'll do it but I wouldn't do like a 30% glycolic on hardly anyone I would recommend them to someone who is completely supremely confident in it mm. you know for me I'm always a bit huh, but that's me um, I'm not a big peel fan mm. um, because I think there's a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of variation and when I'm thinking about procedures I want procedures that I know are reliable and you know that you get consistent results the same sort of time and I think peels have now been superseded by some of the other devices where you can get quite definite things you've got the right settings you've yeah. got all of these sorts of things so I'm not the biggest fan of peels I've never mm. had one um, I wouldn't personally advise deep I think there are better treatments out yeah I think they definitely had their time even when I was yeah. doing treatments years ago they yeah. had their time where it was 100%. like wow this is great and my skin's really surfaced and stuff but like Literally. you say now if you go to like a Joanna Vargas or a Kate Somerville the clinics it's all infrared right. you know it's all non-ablative it's all it's all sort of stuff that really really works and you come out going I can feel that my yeah. skin feels tighter and you know but you haven't had the literally and you haven't had <laughs> so, so basically with chemical all the downtime right 
and you have to sort of wait till the fro you know with 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 chemical peels that dermatologists do you wait for this like frosting point it's a bit subjective you know everyone does a slightly different thing whereas with the settings like the infrared the laser the this and that there are some quite definite parameters mm. with it i am that's why I knew that like doing a deep peel would never be for me because when you get to the frosting, I'm like, get it off. <gasps> Don't let them frost. It get it off. I can't bear it. Yeah. Um, are home LED devices worth the investment? So generally estimated that home devices of any sort are about five times less significant or less strong than any sort of clinic device. I think if you really want to have the benefits of an LED, you're probably better off going to a machine. I'm glad you said that. We've never discussed it, but that's what I've always said. Mm, Thanks, mate. Thanks, <laughs> thank, thank God. Practiced this before. <laughs> thank God. Um, I, I always say, you know, if you are someone who loves them and you find them rejuvenating, because they can be, and some of them are nice and strong, by all means. And also if you're someone who has acne and you feel that they're yeah. helping you. But I just know having experienced and given LED in a clinic setting, it's a different kettle of fish. Totally different. And it's also, you know, if I see people on Insta and they're kind of holding this thing here and I'm like, dude, it needs to be on your nose. Like, yeah. it needs to be here. Um, okay, good. Marvellous. Um, this is a really uh, interesting one. We will see where you sit because they all know where I sit. Skincare okay. while pregnant and or breastfeeding, Ooh. which you've done, yes twice yep so six between us <laughs> i understand that accutane is known to cause birth defects and that no one is going to do clinical trials on a pregnant woman obviously but we seem to have gone down the slippery slope to women being made to be afraid to use any product 100 mm. percent that has any kind of vitamin a derivative in it same with salicylic and even with chemical sunscreens now meanwhile a lot of OBGYNs ask if you're eating the said product and then just move on Will we, our doctors in the skincare industry, ever come to a more balanced and consistent view on this? You say what you think and then I'll jump in. I, this is such a good question because I see so many pregnant women and they come and say, like, my doctor Panicked. said I couldn't use anything, not, or my pharmacist said not to use anything, like, and they've got really active skin or they want to use something. And I think that we really run the risk of just saying, don't use anything, wrap yourself up in cotton wool, do nothing mm. about it. Mm. Um, so in terms of retinoids, Oral retinoids, absolutely out. Yep. Topical retinoids, if you know you're pregnant or you know you're trying to get pregnant, don't use them. If you were to inadvertently fall pregnant using a topical retinoid, we would just say stop and then just keep going. And the, the evidence is that actually the amount you're going to absorb is not enough to cause significant damage. But I do use a lot of actives. Mm -hmm. So I use um, salicylic acid, I use up to 2%. I use a lot of azelaic in mm -hmm. pregnancy because I think that can work really nicely, and particularly once you get up to the sort of 20%. And um, so those are the sorts of, uh, and glycolics and lactics as well. So but you I see, there are, there are plenty of people, and, it, and again, I'm sorry, but it does all come from America, mm -hmm. where you're treating pregnant women. And the reason I said we've got six between us is because that means we've had, you know, six viable births is a way to say it, yes. you know, we won't get into the miscarriage situation, but when you've been pregnant numerous times, you know your skin, you know what feels right, and to be t to be treated as if you're ill yeah. really annoys me. That's where I was coming from. So especially in America, there's this whole wrapping pregnant women up as if they can't possibly do anything for themselves mm -hmm. and don't use anything active. Use Cetaphil, kill me now, and a basic moisturiser. And I think, no, 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 don't do that. How did we survive years ago when like, I'm sure my grandmother smoked and drank through her pregnancies, I'm sure, you know? Do you know who I am totally... Not that I'm advocating that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, obviously. <laughs> but if you speak to, there's an amazing professor of obstetric medicine who, and um, when I was working in the hospital, um, every so often, you know, a pregnant woman would fall pregnant on something, or you'd have a pregnant woman that had a skin condition and you wanted to be able to treat her with something mm -hmm. or whatever it was. And every time I'd be like, professor, can you help me? And she was always like, no, chill out people are pregnant they're not sick they're yeah. not disabled sometimes you have to treat things during pregnancy you're going to do it safely but actually knowing when it really matters what actually matters and not just blankly saying you can't do anything yeah um, that's so frustration. i'm totally totally with you. there's so much that you can do yeah and um, so yeah you don't have to use nothing and um, you can just choose it carefully for those sort of nine months but absolutely loads of stuff you can and do. breastfeeding fine so I'm really it's, happy with retinoids and breastfeeding. So am I, and, and, and I, I'm always careful, obviously, because I don't have the numbers after my name. I'm not like the big, but, <laughs> and so I'm hesitant, but I, you know, I tend to soften it up. In the early days, I would go, you're fine. No. Just because we all did it in the industry. Now, of course, I'm at the stage where I have to be more careful because there's people watching this for the first time who have never seen me before and just think, well, who is she? And that's an absolutely valid point. But that's why I make sure people like you have access to an audience like this because you just want someone to say, I'm not making it up, yeah. please. And, and again, it's more from the point of view of, please don't worry. No. Exactly. The worrying to me is worse than actually just using the occasional retinoid. 
Yeah. I mean, someone said my doctor, I'm breastfeeding my doctor, said I, can't, I have to st still stay off the retinoids, but my acne is flaring up. And I said, are you rubbing it on your nipple? Literally. Then get feeding and get that retinol on your face. The amount you're going to absorb and the amount that's going to get into breast milk is tiny. And then once the baby's born, actually that's not so much of the issue. You know, if it rubs off, you're going to see occasionally you might get a little bit of irritation. on the, That's the worst that would ever happen and I've never had it happen. No. I'm very happy with retinoids and breastfeeding. She's very happy with I'm retinoids very happy. and breastfeeding. Just putting that out there. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I would love some advice <laughs> for how to minimise the appearance of open pores. I think the key word here is the appearance. Everyone is obsessed with their pores. Oh my god, they're so obsessed with their pores. Everyone is obsessed, and poor old pores. Because you know what, pores actually do quite a good job. You need pores, your pores. skin has pores. Your skin is an organ and it needs its various different structures within it. Um, but people hate their pores, and I spend a lot of time talking about pores. So do I. Dublin, yes. again. <laughs> I see you. Um, open and closed, you're right. Pores are not sort of muscles. Doors. They're not. They, they are just there. There, there is a muscle there to, to bring up your hair or let, let your hair down, but the actual pore itself does not open and close. They can get blocked mm -hmm. right? and they can get clogged, but they don't open and close. So what can you do to help open pores? Well, you can certainly, you can't totally change pore size. You can get them clearer by retinoids, by salicylic, lactics, glycolics, um, and you can try and prevent them getting larger over time. We definitely know that pore size definitely pore gets size bigger. Pore size gets bigger. Right. As you get older, then you bring in your tret. Exactly. <laughs> but it's because basically the collagen, which acts like a big cushion, right? As that's starting to sort of get get a bit less efficient and start to degrade a bit, then your pores just seem more it obvious. It looks so much surface. bigger. Exactly. And um, so I think it's about making sure they're clear and making sure that they don't get too big, that you're protecting your skin over time and just not sweating the small stuff, right? I know, but it's a really hard message to sell to people when a similar conversation I had with Ian Marber. Uh, the video before where we were talking about fear cells yeah, yeah. and constantly telling people that you shouldn't be able to see pores yeah. cells so if someone said to me and they thought they were paying me a really big compliment i can't believe your skin you have no pores and i said babe i'm 50. my, my pores are sort of like shriveled up and dried i you know i have to fill them with oil to make them look glowy <laughs> <laughs> so i but my daughter goes look at all this and i'm like all i see is beautiful skin yeah. And I won't have it. I'm just like, stop. She gets one hormonal spot and it's like acne, acne. I'm like, no, no, no. We're, we all have face, faces and skins that are supposed to look as if you are living a life. Yeah. That whole mattified Instagram look is on Instagram yeah. because it's not real. Glass skin, yeah, absolutely. I think the other, the other big culprit, magnifying mirrors. Oh, I'll say that all the time. I, mean, oh, I love you. Rude. We haven't even talked about this, but I say to people, the first thing they said again in Dublin, do you own a mag mirror? No. Great for makeup, great right. for plucking your chin. Right. Get them away from your pores. Genuinely, it's just not the sort of magnification you want to be looking at your skin at. <laughs> I am the only person that should be looking at skin at that magnification as a dermatologist. You know, just don't do it. It's going to make, it's life is going to be miserable. Just I mean, if I had look in my mag mirror all the time to look at my skin, I would be like, God, don't. I just I'd go like this, pluck and put it away. <laughs> okay, Milia, which products are most likely to cause them and which are most helpful? And there's a thank you there. Thank you. Oh, I like this polite person. Thank you. Um, so... <laughs> Milia are so common, mm -hmm. aren't they? So really, really common. And I think there is definitely a genetic influence. I've got a few people in, in clinic that actually families seem to get them. Really common around the eyes. I don't really understand why they happen. Rubbing the skin can definitely um, cause them sometimes. So if you see if people are sort of rubbing their eyes, they've got a lot of eczema or something. Um, and then I think the richer the product, the more likely they are to sort of produce milia. So I tend to find that the heavier, cloggier sort of creams, the ones that are really sort of heavy and quite occlusive, mm. um, can tend to cause them a bit more. So sometimes like mineral oils and things like that. I like a oh, mineral oil. I love that you said that. I'm just not going to say anything on that matter whatsoever. What? what? Because what I, I said? I'm not a fan of mineral oil. Oh. So I've kind of softened my approach in terms of, I know that, I, you know, I recognise that it can be helpful. Like Aven, their whole line is based on mineral oil because it's for a sensitised yeah, skin yeah. and it is a good occlusive. Yeah. Most people aren't allergic to it. Yeah. I understand it. But from a facialist point of view I would never massage with a mineral oil Fine. it doesn't go anywhere and it just makes the no, face feel greasy I use like beautiful really light plant oils yeah so that's where my thing came from but I'm glad that you said that oh, god I am just tick 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 tick, 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 tick. you get another Ooh. cup of tea <laughs> okay um let's do a couple of big ones so right. cystic acne on the cheekbones and the chin and the jawline i.e hormonal beard how do I treat we'll mm. do that one first okay Cystic acne, like truly cystic acne, big, big lumps that feel what we call fluctuant, i.e. you can feel that there's a little bit of liquid in them. 
is really best treated with some sort of tablet treatment. So mm -hmm. either Roaccutane, I use a lot of spironolactone for people as well, for that, that can work for cystic acne. So I think when you've, the deeper the lumpier the spots, the more likely they are to need tablet treatment actually. And, and so, to be prolonged and to scar. Exactly. Would you just, not to interrupt you, but would you just oh, dwell for a minute on Roaccutane? Yeah. Because to my mind, the difference in the Roaccutane and the dosages available now has been so finesse to what it was even like in the 80s yeah. when it had quite rightly had a lot of negative sort of stories about the side effects. Yeah. Please take the moment to reassure the good people at home. I think Roaccutin, if it's used safely, can be one of the most effective ways of treating acne. Yeah. Um, it, not all acne requires it. Actually, so much of it we can treat with creams, we can yeah. treat um, with skincare, oh, you rules. know, so much stuff that we can do. But there are just times, and people walk into the clinic, and literally, I just say to them, I'm so sorry, but the only thing that's going to shift Roac this is Roaccutin. Mm. But you're right, over the years, we've got much better at knowing how to use it and what dose. And it's the same sort of thing with topical steroids, actually. We've got much better over the last, you know, 30, 40 years about how we use it low dose for some people titrating according to each person's response because we know that not everyone deals with it the same mm -hmm. not everyone absorbs it the same you know mm -hmm. i could take 30 milligrams you could take 30 milligrams totally different absorption yeah. rate so actually using lower doses longer periods of time all of that sort of stuff um, and we can really use it safely i i feel so bad for some of the stories that you hear you know just yeah. hear and i know if it was my child i would just be so anti it and I just get that it's such an emotive issue you know the issue around depression and suicide and yeah. all that sort of stuff it's so emotive but the big studies and all of our collective experience and it's 2020 says, not 1984 or you know it's just it's it can be such a life-changing drug for some people I do I do sort of finish when I'm talking to people about it or it's usually when I'm trying to persuade a parent like you say they'd be safe I say to them I would 100% give it to my kids it's all the time. It's the easiest way to put it. Right? If it was if it was my child and it's it's my I think I wouldn't give it to you, I'd go to see you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'd give it. Um, but I always say if it was my daughter I would just do that. Or if yeah. it was my son I would Better do that. Better for their mental health. But I know I would as well. I mean it's just totally from the heart. There are very few situations where if that acne needs Rakuten that we can't use it. And yeah. and also better that you're not on antibiotics for like three or four, five, ten years. Thank you. Right? Again. Thank you. Where do you stand on the whole and this is not to in any way bash GPs because for a lot of people that's all they can do they can go to a GP they can't afford to go private I get that it takes months and months and months to go on a waiting list I understand that where do you sit on the antibiotic situation okay so let's have it doc let's have it bottom line tablet antibiotics for acne can be really useful for three to six months maximum they should never be used as treatment by themselves they should always be used in combination with creams at six months you stop the antibiotic you keep going with creams if you can't win with that you're on to something else done oh, i actually love you so much right now oh, come on. Thank you. okay fungal acne now this mm. cracks me up uh it's appeared out of nowhere as it's if it's this thing. new thing. Big thing on social media. Yeah, uh, and I saw, I, can't remember, I think it might have been kind of Stephen, who's a cosmetic scientist on uh, Instagram, who basically just this thing and said, if you search in the medical directory for fungal acne, it says does not exist. Because <laughs> we call it something else, but my concern is, and the reason I want to bring it up is to sort of reassure people, that it's also become something else that we, we can throw another product at. When actually, the treatment is because, what's it called? Pterosporum folliculitis. I love folliculitis. Yeah. It was one of the first things I learned as a therapist. I was, and they were just like, it's folliculitis. Mainly when we were talking about fannies, to be fair. Oh, yeah. A lot of folliculitis down there. A <laughs> lot of folliculitis. <laughs> um, so tell us what it actually is. So it's an inflammation of the hair follicle, which is caused by a yeast called pterosporum. Um, and it's, sometimes it's quite hard to tell the difference between that yeah. and acne. But I think the major differences are that it tends to be what we call in derm terms monomorphic. Like you get lots of these tiny little things that look so similar. Yeah. It's very commonly on the forehead. They're tiny little red pussy spots and they all look really, really similar. It can often happen in like hot environments. Mm -hmm. And if you've been on antibiotics, we we're just talking about antibiotics, sometimes you yeast. upset the microbiome, right? And then you get this overgrowth of yeast and then it's really hard to treat and they give you more antibiotics. Do you find it's more common in worse. teenage boys? I get asked a lot by parents of boys and generally in hot countries. Hot countries, definitely. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I see it equally in yeah. males and females, actually. Um, I don't think And the treatment it. is? Antifungals. Um, so antifungals, not antibacterials. Exactly. And not anti-acne products. No, so antifungals, often stripping out the antibacterials within a regime, so um, trying to make sure that you're using things which just are sort of actives without that added, because a lot of the anti-acne products we have have got an antibiotic added in them, yeah. so you might want to strip those out. 
either antifungal cream. It can be quite tenacious. It can really yeah. hang on. Yeah. Occasionally, I require um, tablet antifungals as well. But you're right. Antifungals is the key. It's not a bacterial infection. Oh, I'm going to marry you at the end of this. Now, okay, let's do two more to finish, which again are at the other end of the scale, and then one another one, nice one to end off with being a derm. Best things to minimise severe eczema. Um, I don't know why minimise as opposed to I would take it to I'm mean that that, that, that that person has tried everything. Is probably, it reads to me they've probably tried everything. So let's do treat and or minimise. I don't think eczema is particularly well treated, actually, mm. if I'm honest. I've treated so much eczema. I used to do a lot of kids and adolescents and treated so much eczema. And the really good thing is that actually it can be treated. We have so many good treatments for eczema now, but often people aren't just aware of them. And when I'm thinking about eczema, I think about all the reasons why it tends to happen. And the first thing is barrier function. So yeah. we talked about barrier function before, but people who've got eczema have got a slightly weaker sensitized, you know, drier barrier. Then there's the immune system issue. Um, your cells in your skin are just not working quite as they should do. And then there's the abnormal microbiome. So the level of bacteria is all over the place. And actually what I think is you absolutely have to treat all of those three things. Mm -hmm. And you can put all of them in place. It really works. So barrier function, your moisturizers, right? But making sure you're not using anything that's actually going to make things worse. The amount of people with eczema, I'm like, so what do you wash with? I'm like, so, like, what? Why are you doing that? Mm. So, right, like, really protecting a barrier with what you use to cleanse, what you, what you use as your mm. moisturiser. And then the anti-inflammatory part, which is topical steroids. Do you get a lot of topical steroid hate on the... Constantly, and it drives me nuts. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't drive me nuts that you're asking me the question, I just want to be clear. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's again, the misinformation from, I have to say, my own industry who are like, no, 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 don't do that. It's too challenging for your skin. It gets into your system. It shrinks your liver. Right. I'm like, what right. are you talking about? The amount of people that would have been going on with a misery of eczema because they're scared about using topical steroids. But I think it's not just your industry. It's my industry yeah. too. The amount of people that are reinforced, oh, don't use it for too long. Don't use it to mm. um, use it really sparingly. You get here that by the pharmacy, your GP, the receptionist. You know, just everyone starts to. You know, even some dermatologists are really, really scared. And again, it's like reacting. Use safely and effectively it can just be really life-changing. So topical steroids. For the face, I use a lot of like topical calcium neuron inhibitors. So that's things like Protopic and Elida, which are not steroids. And I make sure that I'm using those creams as much as I know is safe and yep. as much as possible. And often it's transformative. Um, and we used to say like, use the cream, then stop and just wait for it to flare up again. And now if I think about that, that's crazy. Why would you wait, Why for, would you wait for it to right? flare up? So now we use a lot of pulse treatment, something called weekend treatment. So even when you've calmed things down, if your eczema just keeps on going, if you use it twice a week, we think that it's really quite safe, but also a good way of preventing flares. And over time, it actually reduces your like steroid use. Um, so steroids for the body, topical calcium urine inhibitors for the face. And then there is a whole host of new other tablets and injections and things that are really revolutionizing the way that we treat severe eczema. So it does seem to, seem to get like poo pooed, like eat some omegas and use a rich cream. Right, it can be, it can it's be. equally as debilitating as acne. So, so difficult, but in some ways it's, it's more symptomatic. The amount of like sleep deprivation, time off work, time off mm -hmm. school, I mean, it's just, it can be absolutely. And discomfort. Disabling, absolutely. Kind of discomfort in a way that acne isn't. Right. Acne can be a bit sore when you've got spots coming through, but if your hands are cracked and bleeding and your elbows and... And you can't sleep at night because you're just like... Argh. Yeah. So if you've got severe eczema, definitely, definitely get treatment. And if you find that the creams don't work, it's a derm matter. So... Nothing wrong with that. Speaking no. of derms, we're going to finish with this. Okay. I would like to train to become a dermatologist myself. What's the best advice you can give me to get started in this field? God knows we need you. I, well, we absolutely do. I'm not being funny. I would go back to school and do it myself if I wasn't already halfway, over halfway through my lifetime. Do you know, <laughs> I have to say, and I, at the risk of sounding really smug, it's no, don't an be amazing smug. job. You deserve to be like, smug. Honestly, it's an amazing job. I am truly, truly grateful. Talk to us about your training. So I started way back, 1996, at medical school. I did six years at medical school, and then I went to be a junior doctor. Mm -hmm. And then in this country, and it does vary according to which country yeah, you're it in, you have to do that general medical training. So I did all my like Royal College of Physician things, all my general medical jobs, cardiology, all of that stuff. And then it was four years of derm training, and then a year of fellowship after, and then boom. You know, and you're in. 15 years later, done. You're away. Yeah, exactly. 
Was there anything, if you hadn't have done dermatology, what would have been your second choice when you were choosing? Which okay. avenue? What did you enjoy? So you know what I say now is that if I hadn't have done dermatology, I'd have left medicine. Really? Really, I... Interesting. So really interesting. What I realised very passion. early on, number one, it was my passion. So when I was a teenager, I was obsessed with sun because I'm super fair and freckly and my, ki my friends always used to laugh at me because we'd be on the beach in like the Greek island at 18 and I'd be under a parasol, mm. they'd all be telling themselves, obsessed with skin. But also, um, I just found that actually I really love the ability to like talk to patients, you get a bit more time, you get you know all of that sort of mm. stuff. So if I hadn't done dermatology, I mean, I think I would have left medicine, but I went through wow. all sorts of things, obs and gyne. What did you not like? What was just not you? I didn't like the emergency stuff. Yeah. Oh my God, it's life and death. I wasn't life and death would be hardcore. It's so hard. I can't even watch those things like 24 hours in A&E. I just I can't mean, do it. I was like, oh my God, my decision could either, you know. Oh, yeah. God. That's what I wasn't very good at, that whole like, this is life and death. And then you'd spend the whole next day like, oh my God, did I do what the happened? right thing? What happened? Did I not? Yeah. Did I do? Um, whereas... Dermatology is a bit more erudite. You can say you can think about it. You know, it's seldom you can life and death. Look at manoeuvre. Yeah, and, you yeah. can like phone a friend. You can do all phone sorts. Phone a friend. Of things. Literally, <laughs> we all have these multidisciplinary meetings. Like, who wants meetings. to be a millionaire? No, no. Do you know what do you think this is? No, literally, multidisciplinary meetings is a derm. You're all sitting there. What do you think? What do you dumb think? It's brilliant. Mm. We do that, but it's more in a WhatsApp group of specialists. Or, or in the US more than here, because here it tends to be very London centric, which I don't always agree with. I do live here, but in the US it's generally East Coast and West Coast. So we were talking um, with my facial friends like Joanna Vargas and Kate Somerville and Renee Rillo because they form a triangle across the USA. So Renee's in Texas, Joanna's in New York and LA, and Kate's in LA, right? And just opened in New York. So if one of their clients celeb, is going to LA and they can't right. make it, they phone and they go, okay, this is what she has, da 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 da. And, and it's a free for all of passing, like that trust of passing back and forth. Those kind of, and also we do, what do you think of this product? Right. Oh, oh, we've used it with this, it was awful, but it's great for this, unexpected. And you're like, oh, it's amazing. But it's not quite your level, Doc, no, no, but it's, but totally it's the same. How industry you the drug? same. When a new drug comes out, have you used this drug? What do you think of it? How do you use it? You know, actually, that's what good people do. They know that, you know, they know when they're really good at something and then they ask someone else when they need to learn a bit. Right? Yeah, Dunning-Kruger effect. Now, uh, what should this lovely person do who wants to train to become a dermatologist? Oh, yeah, what yeah. would you suggest? Um, so you have to go to medical school, first of all. In the UK, um, you're in the UK. I mean, anywhere, but yeah, yeah just for um, us. And then you have to start on medical training. And the minute you get out of medical school and you're in the hospital, even before, actually, lots of projects which show that you are really interested in dermatology. In fact, dermatology is currently probably the most um, competitive medical specialty in the UK. It's which is really a shame a because there's such a shortage. It's such. What such do you think? A what's the for those of us who aren't in it every day? What's the why is there a shortage if they're so competitive? Basically, with the history of training numbers over time is that there was a period where there were lots of dermatologists and they didn't train as many and then that whole thing has a knock-on effect mm -hmm. you know 10 years later yeah. so actually then we ended up with not many dermatologists and it's difficult to find training posts i think the, the smaller the number then the less hospitals do dermatology a lot of it's now in the community yeah. and so it's harder to find these training posts it's it's sort of multifactorial mm -hmm. um, and it's not a good situation at all because actually Everyone at some point in their life has some problem with their skin. So we need that expertise. Totally. Um, so it's a real shame. Go to medical school. Yeah, go to medical school. Please become, become a, dermatologist. a dermatologist. Thank you so much. So You're, I'm just letting you know now that you are definitely coming back. I am definitely. I'll be knocking on the door. I'm telling you that they are sitting there going, when's the next one? When's the next <laughs> one? So I will list um, the docs contact details below how you can get in touch with her how you can go and see her she saves your face do you remember when i came in to see you and i said because she won't say it to you because it's patient privilege but i can say i went in and i was like doc <laughs> what the hell is this and i just come back from my mum's and i think we thought it might be my mum had used a different soap powder yeah. and i would been sleeping at my mum's house anyway i was covered in just it was dermatitis just red you could just if i turned my face it looked just like hundreds of little red bumps basically Same. and this lovely lady said okay well are we are we doing a calm uh, a yeah. calm measured approach or are we nuking it uh, and I, I said I'm on this morning on Wednesday and she went we're nuking it okay yeah, totally. do you know what you reminded me of it's like when the brides come in and they're like I'm getting married at the end of the week I'm like uh-huh uh-huh okay and in my mind I'm like okay we are nuking this we're nuking literally, it literally literally <laughs> and it was the same with you and I'm calm I'm like so what sort of approach do you want to take but in my head I'm like okay we're nuking it just she needed to edit. Throw it worked. At this. It worked. I was just throw throw everything at me. <laughs> I can stay indoors for twenty four hours. It's fine. Just do what you have yeah. to do. Yeah. So thanks for saving my face. Oh, anytime. anytime. Um, we will see you soon. Thanks, folks. Bye. Bye.